So welcome uh, everybody. This is an IPCLC activity. We are planning to discuss uh, issues about COPD and multimorbidity. The original plan was uh, to discuss it in a face-to-face, -face, let's say, discussion. But unfortunately, this didn't happen uh, due to COVID. And uh, as I said, this was the only solution to do it through this uh, video call. And uh, it's an IPCLG initiative with, uh, which is uh, supported by uh, an unrestricted grant from Beringer Ingelheim. So here we are some colleagues, academicians and clinicians from different countries that we will discuss about the multimorbidity and COPD. And together with us is uh, Rudy Pesce, who is uh, the only secondary care uh, person. I'm very happy that you are with us. Jan Willem Cox from uh, Netherlands, Rudy is from Belgium, Bjorn Stalberg from Sweden, Claudia Vicente from Portugal, and Christian uh, from uh, Norway. So uh, this uh, video is accompanied by a desktop helper which you can find available uh, in the IPCRG website and it is translated with uh, uh, in different languages and the website is www.ipcrg.org and it is uh, accompanied also by some cases that we try to, to teach the issues that relate to COPD and uh, multimorbidity. So uh, let me start with um, Jan Willem Cox uh, first. So Jan Willem, do you think multimorbidity is an issue for patients with COPD and why is that? And please yes, introduce so you. yourself uh, shortly. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ioana. Um, yes, I'm Jan Cox. I'm a general practitioner in Groningen, in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, I'm professor of inhalation medicine, and uh, I'm current president of the IPCRG. And uh, I lead a research institute uh, looking at real-world evidence in primary care in the Netherlands and uh, internationally. Um, Iwana, you, you didn't introduce yourself, so maybe you should uh, do that first, and then I'll come back to your question about the um, uh, about yes. the multimorbidity. So my name is Iwana Tiligani. Thanks. I, I was thinking of that. You are in my head. So my name is Iwana Tiligani. I am a general practitioner and an academic in the University of Pretoria. And uh, also, I am the past uh, president of the International Primary Care Respiratory Group. So to the question now, Jan Willem, do you think it's an issue, multimorbidity? What's the situation in Netherlands? Yeah, so uh, yes, uh, I do believe it's an uh, issue. We, uh, we've in the Netherlands had uh, uh, in the past some uh, studies and interest, uh, especially in the uh, relation between uh, COPD and heart failure because there was a, a large Dutch study which showed that 20% of the COPD patients actually had heart failure and vice versa. So 25% of the heart failure patients actually also had COPD when you look at it. So uh, that was about, I think, five to 10 years ago that uh, that study was done and there was quite some interest from that. Um, I think the main interest in, in or main main uh, thoughts about uh, multimorbidity are from that uh, and also from uh, uh, diabetes and ICS uh, and uh, I think that those are the main issues that people know next to the mental <coughs> health problems so uh, but what we actually do about that is is i think quite limited uh we've done a study in the past that uh, we sent out questionnaires uh to to gps uh do you change for example for a lung attack for an exacerbation of copd uh what's your treatment regimen and do you change it according to for example if patients have diabetes and nobody does so or like very few so in general uh as, especially in, in exacerbation management, we don't really see a uh, differentiation uh, based on comorbidity. Okay, and uh, since I started with you, so what does the DATS guideline say about that? Do, do they include information about multimorbidity and what is done mm -hmm. in real, real clinical practice? 
Yeah, so the, the Dutch guidelines, uh, we, we have a specific GP guidelines from uh, our, our College of General Practitioners. Um, and they, uh, in, in the new revision, they actually uh, mention uh, multimorbidity as well uh, to, to, uh, to, to think about that, but not, uh, there's no clear instructions on, on uh, which direction to go uh, with the different uh, uh, multimorbidities. Okay, thank you, Jan Willem. So Bjorn, what's your view about Sweden? What's the situation? Uh, is it an issue? How often do you see multimorbid patients? Do you have guidelines? How, how is the approach? Oh, thank you, Johanna. Uh, short presentation. My name is Bjorn Stelberg. I'm working as a GP in mid-Sweden and also associate professor in family medicine at the University of Uppsala. Uh, I think in my practice, most people with CPD, they are, they are old, they have several diseases. One out of five have diabetes. Perhaps one out of three have some heart conditions and many of them have depression and they are very old too. So this is a, a huge problem because when the patient comes to my practice, they want to talk, of course, not just about CPD. They also want to talk about all their diseases. And in Sweden, we have national guidelines done together with primary and secondary care about specific diseases like CPD, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. But we have no special disease uh, guidelines about how should we manage the patients with multimorbidity. And mm -hmm. I think that's a huge problem for us working in primary care. Okay, it's, so... I, I think it's probably the same in many countries. I think it's everywhere, but le let me see if I get it clear. So if you have the diabetes guidelines, let's say, they don't even mention the COPD and what you have to do if you have a patient with diabetes and COPD, is no. that correct? Yes, that's correct. You, if you go to the COPD guidelines, perhaps you have just a short sentence, treat the patient's heart failure as you should do without COPD, one sentence. If you go to the diabetes guidelines, they have nothing about CPD. And mm -hmm. if you go to the CPD guidelines, there are nothing about the increased risk of diabetes if you use uh, inhaled corticosteroids. So that's a problem. And that's also a problem for, for, for the young doctors, how yes, to manage these patients. And, and I think we need more knowledge. Um, uh, so, so how to treat this? patient with, with several diseases, because we know that I think half of 50% have, have, uh, have at least three or four other diseases of, of our CPD patients. Yeah, thank you Bjork. So Claudia... They are, they are very old, the patient, they are old, they are old. Thank yes. you Bjork. So Claudia, uh, Please tell us your view as well. What's the situation in Portugal and how common? How do you do it in practice, guidelines, all this that have already been raised? Hi, good morning. My name is Claudia. I'm from Portugal. I'm a GP also. Um, so the situation, it's not so different from what Bjorn has told. Uh, we don't have um, extricated guidelines. We have some... Um, lines that are written for in general for all the practitioners for pneumologists for for gps uh, they are not updated and we have uh, very uh, oriented ways how to do it with the, the the patient that has diabetes that has hypertension uh, but not for copd uh, we don't know how many how many times we should have an, an appointment per year or how should we manage all this morbidity that we know that is associated 
to COPD. What happens is when the patient comes, the, the GP has to ask actively for the symptoms and for the therapy, how it goes. And besides that, we, we take the chance of having that appointment for hypertension or for diabetes uh, or for women's health. And we make a review for COPD. And that's very hard because all the time and all the procedures are just um, uh, connected to, to other diseases and not for COPD. So we have to put it on the same time and to review all the steps and all the, the polypharmacy that is associated to these patients and, and do it in a short time. So it's hard. We always have to ask. And we know this kind of patient uh, sometimes doesn't complain. And it's very connected with some uh, frailty and to some family support that is needed. So it's, it's hard to, to manage all this. And so, besides that, the, the medications for COPD, uh, they are sometimes they are hard to, to buy also. So Claudia, what I'm hearing, hearing you say is that this is a challenge as uh, it was uh, for, for the other countries uh, as well. It's the same, uh, I think this is the point to say it's exactly the same for Greece, uh, the national guidelines, we don't have many and the only ones that we have is for primary care. They don't take in consideration the multimorbidity. And because I also teach um, the, um, and I'm responsible for the registers of uh, general practitioners, I must say the word multimorbidity is not uh, included in their favorite items because uh, they don't have clear guidelines, let's say, to, to the place uh, uh, to, to read about it. Uh, but uh, do you think this change, this common, let's say, clinical uh, practitioner, and uh, not you, that you are uh, with a special interest in the respiratory diseases, for example, if he has a patient with COPD and diabetes takes in consideration the risk uh, of uh, medications? Uh, yes. It's uh, well. It's hard to do it and to 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 manage, but but people do it. I think they'll do because we're talking more and more about uh, respiratory diseases, uh, and I think in all these actual contests, uh, people will be more aware of of this challenge. Thank you. So, Christian, can can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us your view about Norway, if it's possible? Uh, yes, my name is Christian Heines. I'm a GP from Norway, from the southwest of Norway, and uh, I'm also the chair of the Norwegian branch of the IPCRG. Uh, and, and our situation is pretty much the same as in Sweden. Uh, the, 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 the bit embarrassing side is that Norwegian COPD guideline is over 10 years old and has been under revision for the last two to three years, and we're still waiting for it. Um, Due to the change of international guidelines, it's been changed over the re revision process. So, so we don't really know and we don't have a, an actual guideline to use. Uh, and therefore, there is no guidance on, on what to do with a multimorbid COPD patient. Uh, the experience is that the patients are much the same as Bjorn describes from Sweden. They're old, they're multimorbid. Most of them have more than one disease. Uh, but the average GG, and due to the way the, the Norwegian primary care is organized, they quite often lack the, the, um, the focus on the multimorbid patient. So we quite often experience, <clears throat> sorry, we quite often experience the, uh, a situation where we tend to forget or ERs or uh, secondary care tend to forget the fact that they do have multimorbid uh, diseases and they just treat like they normally would do. So they don't, more often than not, they don't um, take it into consideration, neither in primary or secondary care. So that, that's the impression from Norway. So this is quite important to, to get a focus on the importance of taking into consideration heart disease, diabetes, and so on. Thank you, Christian. So 
Rudy, you are the only secondary care physician. Thank you for uh, joining uh, with this primary care task group. So I really, I would really love to hear your thoughts about how the pulmonologists uh, deal with the patients with multimorbidity. Do, do they take this in consideration? Do they do something different? What's your view? And, and the, is this activity that we had also, do you think that it could be used also as a lesson for the pulmonologists as well? Of course, of course. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Rudy Peche. I'm chest physician. I'm working in Belgium. Um, I'm also the past president of the Belgian Respiratory Society. So the first problem is the awareness of COPD. Um, COPD is not very well known. Uh, COPD is an acronym, so we have a problem of vocabulary, we have a problem of uh, communication. So that's already a big problem. Then comorbidities in COPD are very frequent. And unfortunately, the Belgian doctors don't do better than the other doctors and specialists are, have a tendency to focus on the organ and not on the body of the patient they have in front of them. And it's often the case that they think about the cardiovascular comorbidities, but not on the other ones. And osteoporosis, diabetes, depression, anxiety. It seems that most of the specialists have no time with deal with, to deal with it. Then in COPD, there is another problem. The treatment is in an inhalator. And most of the patients have comorbidities that, that have a tendency to, to um, that will give more difficulties for those patients to take correctly the inhalator. We were speaking about aging. Those old patients are not able to use correctly a PMDI, for example. And then we have no guidelines, national guidelines in Belgium. Um, as you know, as, as in other countries, we do have two or three different languages. So we, do, we don't have national uh, guidelines. We are following goal guidelines. And as you know, goal guidelines is focusing on non-pharmacological treatment, pharmacological treatment, tendency to bronchodilate first, and then ICS if necessary. But there is a hope. For example, um, uh, URS has published very recently ICS withdrawal guidelines. And they do speak in those guidelines about comorbidities and risk due to ICS. It's a beginning. So it's changing, but we, we all have together to increase the awareness, not only on comorbidities, but on the disease itself. Thank you. So Rudy, one question for you as well. So do you think uh, you or your colleagues, let's say, have a different approach because you are a, a typical specialist, let's say, when you see a COPD patient without comorbidities and the COPD patient with comorbidities and especially with multimorbidities, is this, how, how do you do it differently? Not I, only you, I, 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 may, I am mainly interested for the colleagues. What, what's your view on that? The, 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 the reflex, the, the, the first thinking is that, okay, is, is the patient a cardiovascular disease? Then of course, Laba Lama could be maybe a problem if the problem uh, is the patient as a natural fibrillation. That comes immediately in mind. And then also for the Lama, if the patient has a glaucoma or prostatism, then I have to pay attention to it. And then, of course, there is the ICS. If my patient has a path of maybe frailty, old age, or pneumonia, then I will think twice before putting uh, ICS a high dose or a long term. That would be, the, I think, that the specialists are thinking about those three, atrial fibrillation, prostatism, and risk of pneumonia. That, I think, it rings a bell. But depression, anxiety, and then a lot of other ones, I think most of us don't think even about it. Okay, thank you. So again, Vilan, do you think you can give us some challenges with polypharmacy pharmacy? And how do you think, let's say, where does GP should focus? So for example, if they have diabetes, what is the issue there? Yeah, I, th I think one of the challenges and also because the, the project, and if you look at the case 
studies that come to, uh, that, that go with this uh, this program, you actually see the difficulty in 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 clinical reasoning because it's becoming more. If you don't have the guidelines, you have to balance several uh, issues uh, in your mind, and that is more like the art of medicine rather than uh, stick to guidelines, and um, uh, especially when we try to uh, develop all these decision trees for the uh, based on the desktop helper uh, people ask okay when people have two or three mobilities that are in the desktop helper which one goes first which one is the most important one and um, I think that there is the, the 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 balance we need to seek and where the the real art of medicine comes in place because then you need to do the clinical reasoning over several diseases. So I think if a patient has uh, frequent exacerbations, and for example, uh, if you do have an old eosinophil count in your, your, uh, uh, in your laboratory results and think, okay, this might be a patient for uh, ICS, he, uh, he might benefit. What to do with the diabetes that's there as well? Because we know also that uh, uh, initiation with ICS or ICS, it's uh, uh, major therapy uh, will have effect on diabetic control. So I think those are the challenges. What what to do? Because on the one side you you want to have it, and if the patient has diabetes and has uh, exacerbations, how to balance that? And I think the uh, um, then it, it is indeed for that individual patient with these different. Uh, uh, comorbidities or multimorbid patient uh, because we call it comorbidities because we think from the COPD to the other uh, diseases um, in that case you really need to think about all the pieces of the puzzle and I think there that takes time to think and the thinking things takes time um, but it also requires good information. I think for that, the desktop help could help. At least you know then what's what's the uh, uh, what's really there to 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 choose. Um, and for that patient with and diabetes and uh, uh, pneumonia and exacerbations, well, it is how severe are these exacerbations? And and in that case, I might consider okay, continue the ICS, but have some additional or start ICS and have some additional checks on the diabetes, for example. Yeah, but I suppose you mean if ICS are needed, because we know from uh, literature that uh, all the countries overuse the ICS. Mm -hmm. and the problem is that. So if it's not needed, yeah. I, I suppose you, you should withdraw. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, but also, uh, so, so it, it is that balance. So if you have a case with all the different ingredients, then we need to be, uh, 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 we need to make con uh, uh, conscious uh, decisions what to do. So indeed, in many cases, the ICS could be redrawn. Uh, uh, but that's why I said, well, multiple uh, exacerbations and high EOs, well, that sounds to be a case that might benefit from ICS. So Bjorn, what do you think? What's uh, what? Which are the challenges that you face, and how? What's the main messages that you would like to give to your primary care physicians? What to take in consideration in case of multimorbidity? So, for example, diabetes and COPD, osteoporosis and COPD. What's your message out there? I I think we have two different groups of patients. Those who get their, their diagnose and what to start with, which medications. And historically, there, are, there were many patients who got ICS from the beginning without indication. So I think that you have to, to think a lot, which medication should you start with? And of course, for us, it's easy because we know the CPD guidelines. But most GP doctors, they have to follow a lot of guidelines. 
Some of them knew everything about diabetes. And then their patient have got a, a, a CPD diagnose. And they do what they have done for many, many years. And perhaps start with, with ISS without a, a, an indication. That's one problem. How to educate our, our colleagues, the young yeah. ones. And, and the other problem is, like you, young William, talk about when, when we see a patient, perhaps on triple therapy, without any real indication, should we uh, withdraw the ISS or not? And then we have, of course, to think about the risk of when they have different comorbidities. So I think one issue is how, how, how could we increase our knowledge in primary care? Because the problem is we have so many diseases, and we have so many patients, and perhaps too little time to read guidelines and everything. So there is a lot, uh, a lot of problems. But we can Thank you, Bjorn. So Christian, what, what's your view? Which are the challenges to your view? I'm, I'm specifically interested also on the polypharmacy and also on the combinations of medications. So for example, as we said, LABA and atrial fibrillation is one that Rudy mentioned. ICS and osteoporosis is something that we didn't discuss at all. So what's your view? Which no, no, I, I think that... Uh, I think that most uh, uh, the, the, the kind of large diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and, and uh, are, are more often uh, you take the comorbidities into consideration. So what's quite often forgotten is things like like uh, osteoporosis, for example, uh, where we don't really remember that that uh, high use of steroids over time can be an issue. Um, these patients are, in my experience, they have a massive polypharmacy uh, because they are multimorbid and they have, we tend to treat all the medications, uh, all the diseases with, with a lot of medications and, and uh, maybe both uh, the endocrinologists and, and the, the uh, cardiologists have been quite good at pushing forward all the importance of the, of the medications for their diseases. Uh, which uh, leads to, to a massive polypharmacy. Uh, we do not have enough uh, focus on this in, in our practices and, and uh, we need more education. I believe that to, if we could get the, the, the government on our side in, in putting in a multimorbidity and uh, chapter in each guideline, that would really uh, help focus uh, the fact that this is an issue for, for all these diseases. And you, you should really look to that chapter whenever the patient has a, a chronic disease uh, of any kind. So that would be a good idea. Thank you, Christian. J just to, to say at this point, because I don't want to, to leave uh, the wrong message, let's say for our followers, that uh, as when we speak about corticosteroids, we also speak about inhaled corticosteroids, and Absolutely. we know that there is there is a high risk uh, for diabetes deterioration and initiation of diabetes, and also for osteoporosis. But we shouldn't forget the pneumonia and the tuberculosis. And I think this information is not in the hands of uh, primary care physicians. Because in a study we had in Greece, for example, 80% used ICS LABA uh, in primary care. And uh, in a qualitative study, it was shown that they used it without uh, taking in consideration multimorbidity. They didn't know about the ICS and the harm for other diseases. And also they used it because the diagnosis uh, was not sure at the beginning. So they were thinking, is it asthma or is it COPD? Let's put an ICS lab to be sure, because of course we don't want to take out the ICS lab from asthma. So I think there are many challenges and I just wanted to clarify it's, it's not only for the oral corticosteroids, but it's also for the inhaled ones. So Claudia, what's your view? The so you, you pointed, uh, yes, you, you pointed a very important one that I, I was thinking about oh. the confusion of diagnosis. And, Sorry. 
No, 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 you did it uh, perfectly, because I think this just means that we have all the same problems across the country. Besides that, um, I, I think um, what uh, you were telling about osteoporosis, because from diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, people think about them because uh, patients value them more or because we have more guidelines or they're more talked about. But for example, for osteoporosis, nobody thinks about that. And nobody thinks that we have to draw uh, a COPD, uh, um, ICS on COPD because of osteoporosis. And mainly because of this kind of diseases is more frequent in women. And we know COPD is different in men and in women. Um, other challenge is not just not the fact that um, the family doctor has a lot of guidelines that are connected to all the diseases that we manage. It's the frequency with the, that the guidelines are updated. For example, COPD, it's updated every single year. And in the past few years, uh, some important things are, are being changed. That's good for science and for the patients, but it's very hard to, to a family doctor to know every single year what what's changing. And besides that, to reassess all the patients with the new guidelines. So I think this is also a challenge uh, to add to all the challenges that we've talked about, the, the time and the multi-morbidity. And I think another thing that is very important, it's the literacy of the patients. Because if they're not able to recognize the disease or the impact that the disease has, has on, on their lives, on, on their family lives also, um, it's hard, it's very hard to manage. And another fact, we're talking about the ICS, but uh, another therapy that we know that's very important on COPD, it's pulmonary rehabilitation. And in, we have a very uh, hard, it's very hard in Portugal to, to get to the program and it takes time. And I think that's another barrier that we have to manage well the COPD patient because it's just connected to secondary care. And inhalation adherence and checking is also very yes. important, I think. Rudy, Rudy talked Thank that you. on the beginning. Thank you, Claudia. So, Rudy, before uh, closing this uh, uh, discussion, uh, three uh, main points that you will uh, suggest to your colleagues, uh, the pulmonologists, uh, as regards the multimorbidity and COPD, and I need practical things. So, uh, you know, what to do. So this is what we need in, in primary care as well. Three points. So I will put in one, at each consultation, check if the molecules that the patient received are very indicated. Is it well indicated to have a LABA, a LAMA, an ICS, one of the combination, double or triple? So check every component. Then second, of course, check about compliance, inhalation technique, and pay attention to automedication, because automedication exists not only with oral corticosteroids, but also with uh, short-acting agents or with ICS. So always check for automedication and compliance. And then finally, the point that is always forget, check for comorbidities, look after them, check them. And if you have in front of you an old lady that is frail and taking ICS for a long time, check for osteoporosis. Thank you. Jan Willem, three uh, main messages, but try to be practical. What to do, please. <laughs> Thank you, Rudy, really to the point. Well, I think Rudy had some excellent points, so I can't think of three additional. That's okay. Um, I, I can live with two or one. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, especially for the multimorbidity, um, indeed, uh, check if these are available. Just before the patient gets in or ask the patients, are there any... Uh, multimorbid conditions that I haven't considered yet that could be of influence. So we've created that list within uh, the uh, desktop helper, which are the ones that are relevant and what to do with the medication. I think uh, just 
pay attention to them would be really uh, valuable. And of course, check inhalation technique, because I always say check inhalation technique, because a lot of things go wrong there. Uh, it might be a, a blessing that if they do it wrong, and uh, there is a comorbidity clash, uh, and uh, that they don't receive all the medication, but actually the systemic uh, uh, exposure for wrongly taken medication is, is very high as well. So uh, in lace technique is very important. Jan. I think these patients are m multimorbid. They have several diseases. And I think the most important thing is to take all their diseases in Together. consideration. And, and I think one problem is when, when you see the patients, usually you, have, you are short in time, so you are perhaps focused just on one or two diseases or there are several diseases. So I think take time and not only discuss the heart diseases, but also discuss the respiratory diseases and take a look at the medication and the risk of getting another diseases because you give the wrong medication. Yes. And, and yes. also reconsider, they, they have a, many of these patients, they have a long list of several medication. Some of them they don't need, or you could decrease the doses and also decrease the risk of getting a new disease. So there's a, there is a lot of challenges. This is not easy. Yes, this is not easy. And Bjorn, would you suggest to, to do a re review of treatment uh, yeah. more often in a multimorbid patient? Yes. yes. Always when you see the patient, of course, you have to discuss the problem for today. But before, yes, of course. You, before uh, you prescribe a new medication, always take a look at the list. Which medication does the patient have? Perhaps five, six, seven. And what's happening happening when you give a new medication? So, so it's not easy, but you always have to take a look at the whole patient. And that's the challenge for, for us in family medicine, in, in primary care. I think in secondary care in Sweden, they have it more easy. If you go to the heart doctor, they only listen to the heart. And if you go to, to the chest physician, they only take care of, of the lungs. So I think the patient, they need us. And we, we have yes. to take it really seriously because we are the most important doctors. Thank you, Bjorn. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, my you, that, that's my experience. That's my experience. I've been a DP since '84. <laughs> I uh, I agree, Rudy. Don't be offended. You're you're also very important. But you know, of <laughs> course, we, we, I, I think uh, uh, um, in Sweden we talk a lot of shared care. Mm -hmm. we, we have the patient, and the patient perhaps also needs a, a chest physician, a heart, a heart physician, and so on, but they still have need uh, the GPs. They need us. And then we talk about shared care between family medicine and uh, as a primary care and secondary care. It's not a secondary or primary, it's, it's both shared care. That's important. And, and can I add Thank to that? Yeah. The, the, that um, uh, fortunately in the Netherlands we have very good relationship with the pharmacist as well. So yes. we've got these regular uh, meetings where, uh, especially for polypharmacy, uh, the the pharmacist uh, does a, a review, uh, checks all the medication, and then pharmacist and the uh, GP will discuss where it's needed. And that's uh, something without the day-to-day -day care. Um, uh, and, and so you've got a bit more time to have this discussion. So I think uh, uh, if possible to, to uh, have this shared care as well with the pharmacist, because uh, they do have a, play an important role and can play an important role 
in, in this multimorbid uh, uh, patient in, in uh, looking at the different uh, combinations, what works well, what doesn't work so well. Thank you. So Christian and Claudia, just one, uh, one or a half point that it has been, it has <laughs> remained. <laughs> so it's harder to talk now, but um, I would say something very similar uh, what we talked in the past few minutes, that is look at the local resources that you have, not the pharmacy only, but also the, the nurses that can help us. They are very important to us and for patients. And, but at the same time, don't take the idea that you don't need to say important information to your patient because sometimes you think that the pharmacy will do it and for some reason they won't. So that's an important issue. I think sometimes um, it's good to write down some information so they, they have the main ideas with them. So they can know uh, they, are, they have to manage their COPD. And I think that's, that's very important for them. And another thing, don't leave the patient go home without a new appointment. Because sometimes they don't complain and they go away and then don't come back. And we need to, to know how they deal with the new adjustments and how they, they feel along the time. So I think that this is important uh, also so, so the patient can feel uh, confident uh, on their therapy and on us. So I would say, look to the, the local resources and make a new appointment to reassess uh, again, the patient. Good. Christian? Well, really, there's, there's not much left for me now, is there? <laughs> <laughs> so, if I would say just one small thing, it's uh, to emphasize the fact that we need to put multimorbidity and uh, drug medical interactions into to a, a checkpoint on any annual follow-up for any disease. So this gets to the front of the mind of the GPs that this is something you have to take into consideration, not only for COPD, but for all kinds of chronic illnesses and diseases we do follow up. And we do currently uh, try to, to get the GPs to more systematically follow up uh, patients with, with uh, chronic diseases in Norway. And this is a quite important point to put into the checklist for, for any disease that you should keep in mind that what you do now could affect the other chronic diseases that this patient has. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Christian. That's, uh, it was the last, but a really good uh, point. You all gave good points, thank you for that. I just want, I just want to say uh, two points from my view. I think a message would be to my colleagues, uh, don't take the easy road, let's say, and prescribe a medication without thinking about the patient holistically. So you have to have a diagnosis. Asthma and COPD is not the same. You cannot consider putting ICS laba because you don't know the diagnosis. And um, the second thing that I would like to, to raise, you raised it as well, is don't think only on the diseases. Think also of the risk. So for example, body mass loss because of inhaled corticosteroids should be considered as well. It's not only the diseases, the comorbidities and the multimorbidity, but also these points. So I want to thank you all for this very nice discussion. I think we helped a lot uh, our colleagues. The main message is to consider COPD and multimorbidity always in daily clinical practice. And I want to thank again IPCRG for giving us the opportunity to build on this material and give this presentation and all the material that are available in the website. And also Beringer Ingelheim for the unrestricted grant to the International Primary Care Respiratory Group. It was really very nice to hear that we have common problems. And we expected that, but it was confirmed today. So thank you all and all the material is available in the website. Thank you. I think we had a nice discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.